Hi everyone, my name is Olga Zelinska and I'm a user researcher with Xbox Research and Design. Today I'll be talking about conducting in-person games user research outside the typical lab setup. My hope is that this talk helps you think about different ways you, as researchers, can adapt your setup to whatever a team throws at you. In my case, I'll talk through my experience with capturing and understanding the player experience in Minecraft Earth. To give a little background, Minecraft Earth is a geolocation-based AR game. Let's break that down. The geolocation portion of this game meant that the phone relied on your GPS to generate a map. Your local neighborhood and streets were turned into a blocky Minecraft world right on your screen. From there, items called tappables would appear on the map. To collect tappables, you would physically walk around your neighborhood, and when you were in range of the tappable, it would become active. You would tap on it a few times to collect it, hence the name Tappables. Tappables would provide resources you would need in the game, such as wood, stone, and glass to name a few. There were even some cool mobs that you could collect, such as the Iron Golem or the Muddy Pig, which was one of my personal favorites. I mean, first of all, it's adorable, and it loves mud. Once it finds mud, the Muddy Pig rolls around and a flower magically grows out of its head. The AR, or Augmented Reality part of the game, came into play in two aspects. First, there were build plates, which are Minecraft worlds you could place on a table or any surface in front of you. From there, you can build a house, create a farm, construct a roller coaster, or do any number of things that you could do in a normal Minecraft game. Outside of build plates, there were also adventures. These were life-sized AR gameplay instances where you would fight mobs, solve puzzles, and mine resources. Originally, players would find adventures in the wild, such as local parks, malls, or throughout neighborhoods, meaning players would need to walk to these locations, and once in range, they could activate and start playing in their adventure. As a user researcher, my goal was to understand three main aspects of the player experience in Minecraft Earth. First, the player perspective. What was the player seeing in the game, and how did they interact with those elements on the screen? For example, when they started building an AR, which area of the build plate were they looking at through their phone screen? What blocks were they selecting? And how were they placing the blocks when creating their new home? Or when playing in an adventure, when hostile mobs appeared on their screen, how did players react when they were being attacked? My second goal as a user researcher was understanding how players positioned their bodies in order to interact with various AR elements, real world objects, and environments. Moving around these AR spaces meant physically moving your body. As we saw in the previous videos, to zoom in on buildings, players would physically move their body closer to the world. To see a different side of a building, players needed to walk around to the other side of the building. And to avoid death by skeleton in an adventure, they would need to dodge arrows being shot at them while simultaneously trying to kill them. Finally, my third goal was to understand what external factors contributed to the player experience in an outdoor setting. A large portion of gameplay and interactions were occurring outside, from walking through neighborhoods to collect tappables to playing in adventures. How did outdoor conditions, such as weather, impact the player experience? A quick note before continuing. All work that is presented today was done pre-COVID. There hasn't been any in-person research since March of 2020. Additionally, Minecraft Earth has announced that it is sunsetting in June due to the unfortunate timing of COVID and the social in-person nature of this game. Although we're saddened by this decision, the team has been incredibly supportive of sharing any learnings we had of measuring, testing, and capturing the player experience with the larger games user research community. So jumping back in. With these new and interactive ways to play a game with building structures in AR and battling mobs in an adventure, the current stationary nature of measuring a mobile game experience in our usability lab wasn't going to cut it. Don't get me wrong. At Xbox Research, and I'm assuming at several other gaming companies, there are fantastic state-of-the-art labs designed to mimic the at-home gaming experience. In addition to the comfortable couches, large TVs, and consoles to represent what you might see in your living room, the labs also have video and audio equipment embedded to capture what the player is seeing and how the player is reacting when playing the game. For example, in this usability lab, we have four cameras that can be adjusted to capture the player's expressions and the environment they are in. 
We also have the technology to mirror what they're seeing on the screen, as well as what buttons they're pressing as they play the game. All of these streams of information are also merged into one screen that makes it helpful to communicate to stakeholders what works well in the game and pinpoints where players are experiencing friction points. There are adjustments that can be made to measure the mobile experience. There is an ability to mirror cell phone experiences to a TV through Apple TV or Chromecast. Android phones have an option to show where people are touching on the screen as they're interacting with the phone. But once we stepped outside the lab to collect tappables or walk to areas that had adventures, the usability lab did not follow us. As a result, we needed to create a new way to capture the Minecraft Earth player experience. The mobile lab setup we created started from humble beginnings of eye tracking glasses and a GoPro and evolved to an all-in-one solution that captured the player experience with the same quality as our usability labs while on the go. Before I go into more details on our mobile lab setup, I wanted to mention that this setup and the several iterations before it would have not been possible without an awesome team of research and operation folks that helped me execute on this idea. So the lab setup had four main parts pictured here. A camera to capture the player perspective, a feed from the phone to show what was happening on the screen, a camera to capture the environment and player movements, and a video encoder. Starting with the first component, a camera to capture the player perspective. We started by adding a pair of Toby eye tracking glasses to our typical lab usability setup. These glasses helped with the first research goal of getting visibility into what the players were seeing and touching on the screen as they were moving through the space and interacting with the augmented reality world. It showed us interactions such as mining wood from a tree above their head or feeding a sheep that was wandering around the world. Although the eye tracking glasses were helpful, the level of precision of seeing exactly where their eyes were looking were not a top priority as we were looking generally to see what screen they were on and what button presses they were taking. Additionally, there was some interference with participants who already had glasses and needed to wear both their pair of glasses and the eye tracking glasses. As a result, we changed equipment to a GoPro camera that a participant wore around their head and was able to point to the screen. One benefit from the researcher point of view is that I could mirror the player feed from the GoPro to another phone through an app or desktop. This allowed for us to see what the participant was seeing on our screens in the lab or on a phone as we walked around outside and also minimize the need for me to be right over the participant's shoulder as they were trying to play the game. To also help with capturing the player perspective, the mobile lab included phone screen mirroring as a second component seen here. The phone screen mirroring provided a reference point for teams to see where players were in the game and what was appearing on screen. Although the player perspective did capture the player's screen the majority of the time, there were times when outdoor conditions made it difficult to see the screen or times when players were looking up and ahead to see where they were walking and may have missed items that appeared on the screen during that time. When in the lab, the screen was typically showcased with an Apple TV. And once we left the labs, screen recording on the phone was turned on. With later iterations, we were able to secure a battery pack to the cart that we used for a GoPro and could actively power an Apple TV and record a stream on the laptop as we went. The third component of our setup was a GoPro, which was held by a person who walked around with us. This camera was key in capturing both the environment the game was being played in and how the player interacted with the environment. For example, how much did a child pay attention to its surroundings while playing the game? Or how did participants move while battling a mob in a life-size adventure? Although the handheld GoPro was extremely portable, the camera footage became a little shaky when handheld. This shaky footage, along with a somewhat shaky player perspective camera, as they looked up and down while walking around, made it difficult to view the feeds side by side. As a result, we attached the GoPro to a cart that we rolled around campus, which stabilized the video. Finally, our fourth component was a tool that brought all the video feeds together, the Pearl 2. Having three individual video sources were good information sources on their own, but the benefit of having all three were maximized when they were shown together to show the complete picture. This feed helped connect the dots of this is where the player was in the game, this is what the player was seeing on the screen, and this is how they physically move throughout the space because of it. 
Initially, the merging of all video streams was done after the usability sessions and post-processing, but that involved a lot of work during and after the session. We would need a unique action at the beginning of each recording so that we would be able to identify start times of all three feeds, and then combine all three streams in Adobe Premiere Pro post-session. Over time, we began using a Perl 2 to merge all three streams together into one live recording during the session. All four components I mentioned fit nicely on a heavy-duty cart which we wheeled around campus. One thing I wanted to call out is that this current setup does not involve a huge production team or budget to create. Three out of the four components that I talked about are available off the shelf and you could buy them in most stores. GoPro cameras and a few GoPro accessories acted as our player head cam and the environmental cam. An Apple TV served as our main screen mirror to showcase what was happening on the screen. And the Pearl 2, I will admit, is a little pricier, but is available through online retailers. If budget is a concern, there are other more affordable options available to combine the video streams after the sessions are done, such as Adobe Premiere Pro. In addition to all the equipment, there were a few other factors that came into play when using a mobile lab setup. First and foremost was player comfort. There were many different ways we could have attached a camera to a player's head. However, not all are super comfortable. If not applied correctly or at a weird angle, the camera weight could cause strain on a player's neck or the tightness of the straps could cause headaches. The GoPro 7, which we used for our setup, weighed a little over four ounces, similar to what a baseball hat weighs. We tested out a few different camera setups to select the best fit, and before each setup was passed on to a player, I personally tried out the setup to see if it was something I would have felt comfortable wearing and playing the game with. Just in case there's any doubters, this picture is from a two-hour expo where I was showing other user researchers in the company our mobile lab setup. Second, with all of this cool equipment comes equipment management. This typically stemmed from making sure batteries were fully charged for each session, there was data available to record sessions, allowing enough time to charge up equipment and transfer data in between sessions, and equipment was connected to and mirroring to the right devices, especially when switching from the in-lab setup to the outdoor mobile lab setup. Equipment management was made easier by having an extra set of hands to help with the setup and tear down between sessions. Finally, weather had a huge impact when testing outside. If it was raining outside, phones would become wet and would interfere when players tried to touch the phone screen to play. If it was too sunny, it was difficult to see anything on the screen to play the game, even when the brightness was set to the maximum. And every once in a while, we would get the rare Seattle snowstorms, which blanketed all of our walking paths on our study routes. So in this talk, we went over the journey of how I adapted a usability lab setup to be more mobile and ultimately help accomplish the three user research goals I had for Minecraft Earth. Specifically, how do you capture the player experience once we stepped outside the lab? The head camera and screen mirroring were critical in understanding what cues the player was seeing and interacting with on the phone screen. By having this perspective, we noticed that players were not initially receiving enough feedback of when a tappable was in range and out of range while we were walking around outside. It also helped us identify different ways players expected to interact with tappables. Some would tap once, some would press and hold, and some would do the intended action of tapping on it multiple times. By capturing these interaction patterns, the team was able to include more feedback of when a tappable was in range or out of range, and provided directions in the game on how to collect tappables to set players up for success. Without capturing the player perspective, we would have not caught the nuanced ways that players interacted with tappables. The environmental GoPro camera and screen mirroring revealed how players positioned and moved their bodies through the AR space while playing the game outdoors. With this view, we were able to capture how players were fascinated by the life-size AR structures on their screen and would move in a number of ways to get better looks at it. For example, walking backwards to zoom out and get a better look of the full structure, trying to find ways to get higher up, such as getting on their tippy toes and lifting up the phone closer to their face to get a better view from the top, and even getting underneath a structure to see every detail. The head camera and the environmental GoPro camera capture the environments outside 
and showed how external factors that we didn't have control over, such as the weather, could impact gameplay. By having this perspective, we were able to capture how brighter conditions outdoors made it difficult to view underground caves and areas, especially if they were dimly lit. This enabled the team to create a bright mode option so that players could set conditions to the maximum brightness and help players see the game area on their screen. If this scenario was tested strictly indoors, we may have never seen how weather conditions impacted the player experience in this way. We iterated several times before we got to the mobile lab setup you see today. And if we were still able to test in person, there are many other things we could have done to continue to advance the setup. First, we could find ways to extend the battery life. Right now, this is very battery intensive and typically would max out at 45 minutes if all components were fully charged. This would not work for extended play tests. Second, as we got more equipment, we started to lose our mobility. We could only go where the cart would be able to go. For the record, the cart was pretty heavy duty, but not great to go up and down stairs or over really rough terrain. The cart also limited us to show the environment from one angle. Third, the setup was very people resource heavy. In our ideal situations, we would have a researcher, a note taker, someone pushing the cart and using the environmental cam, and someone from the game development team in case something went wrong with the build. So at least four people involved for each session. Five people if the participant was a child and a parent needed to tag along. It would be better if we could lower it down to a similar amount that is in a usability lab, one or two. Additionally, with all of these people walking around with the participant, there may have been times, especially with kids, that may have made them feel less comfortable sharing their opinions or playing as they normally would because of all the people looking at them. This is normally something we could control by having more people in the observer room of a typical usability lab, but going outdoors does not have that luxury. Finally, we didn't have a setup that we could easily live stream to stakeholders as we do with our current usability lab sessions. So there are a lot of opportunities to improve the setup, especially as technology evolves. Maybe drones could help more accurately capture a player environment of how a person plays versus a GoPro on a cart. Maybe we create a backpack headband usability setup that people can use in their everyday lives and showcase their playing behaviors as they commute home on a train instead of walking around Microsoft's campus. Maybe we add a hotspot to the cart and set up wireless streaming, which could minimize the number of people that needed to walk around with the participant. The possibilities are really endless. My goal for this talk was to share some of my learnings as we adapt at our lab setup to more authentically capture a player's experience playing Minecraft Earth, and hopefully inspires you to adapt your setup to whatever a team throws at you, and think of ways that you too can capture player experiences outside the lab.